good morning everybody. Uh, today I will be presenting how to work on this uh, PC 1D simulation. So, it is basically uh, simulation software published by uh, the University of uh, New South Wales and uh, it is it basically uh, works on one dimensional transport of uh, electron and holes. And so, there is uh, nothing like a uh, two dimensional transport like uh, as we can specify the finger spacing on the top surface or anything uh, else uh, within the device. So, it basically takes the whole region as one dimension although it shows the uh, overall this is a cross sectional view of the device. So, as we progress uh, in designing the uh, cell we will see how it is happening, but uh, the whole thing happens in one dimension way in the uh, z direction or kind of depth wise. So, E is the emitter part and uh, B is the base part. So, the dimension starts from z dimension 0 is at the emitter level I mean at the top surface and base is the rear surface. So, if you open this file they you will find different parameters to be set here to design the device. So, the first thing is like what is the device area. So, that will be the top surface huh? the radiation the surface where the irradiation is uh, falling. So, we can put it like uh, say if you double click on this parameter you can put the value of the top surface area. So, we can put it like uh, 100 centimeter square let us say. So, generally for 125 by 125 centimeter square cell you can put 156.25, but here we are putting uh, 100 centimeters for our calculation uh, it will be easier. Uh, on the device area, double click on the device area on this point. Yeah, again, all these points will be available on this uh, menu bar. So, if you click on the device, uh, you will you can also put the area from here. So, every option listed here will be available from this menu. Okay, fine. Okay, so next point is the surface texture. So, if you click on this texture you will get an default value of 54.74 degree. So, this is uh, some kind of uh, assuming some facet model. Uh, it takes uh, this is the uh, angle between 111 and 100 plane. So, this things uh, should remain the same I hope and uh, depth you can change according to your uh, model. I mean if you want to have some uh, deeper uh, uh, surface texture then you can change. Let us put it like uh, 3 micrometer only. Yeah, the texture height at the surface. Okay. Yes, please. 100 plane. Uh, see 100 is the plane in which atomic density is very high. So, when you know how the texturing is done. So, yeah, that is the texture uh, pattern, but how is it done is that uh, you put the wafer in a KOH or TMAH solution, where the uh, T KOH this uh, KOH or TMAH solution attack the silicon atoms. Now, the 100 direction the uh, is the depth wise direction in which the uh, etching of the atom will be very fast. So, it will be very deep enough, but the 111 plane will be very slow. So, it will create a pyramid on the surface. Okay. So, that angle is uh, here specified by this 54.74. Now, the third point is the surface charge. This is basically I think everybody is fine with the surface texture, right. Yeah. Okay. So, third thing is that uh, this surface charge, this is basically important in the other uh, kind of semiconductor devices where suppose you grow a silicon dioxide. Yes, please. It will be the flat flat plane surface. If you look at this, let us say, see if if you select this texture, you can see on the surface it shows a textured kind of thing. If you don't select this texture, it will be kind of plane surface. Okay, so it will not take the texturing thing and the reflectance and other things. It will not be there. Yeah, texture. Uh, no, it is basically it is uh, taking only the pyramid structure. You can also go in practice, you can also the go for the inverted pyramid like kind of thing or these are kind of uh, uh, smooth I mean uniform pyramid heights at every distance, but in actual solar cell we do not go for this smooth kind of thing. 
in actual solar cell it forms a random pyramid structure, but those things are not take, taken into this uh, software. So, this is kind of very basic thing for that is why we are taking it is taking only the uniform texture height at every point of the surface. Can that cell be arranged here? So, even here, what you are talking about exactly we are not getting. Okay. So, if it can be arranged physically here, that you can show a point out there. That is a basic, but we will not see it. Okay. If it can be arranged fully better, whatever you are seeing, that will be written by everybody. Yeah, I can arrange one thing, but. Uh, cell or module, whatever you are talking about. I can arrange the cell, that is not a problem, but only th the thing is that you cannot be able to see the textures because it is 3 micrometer. <laughs> So, you will see a plane surface that is all. Okay. So, I am arranging a cell. So, let me finish it and I will arrange a cell then we will. Yeah, yeah, sure, 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 obviously. Okay. The next thing is the front surface charge. So, this is the charge accumulation on the top surface. So, this is basically important in other kind of semiconductor devices like. Uh, where you are suppose growing some silicon dioxide on the top and due to the difference in the solubility of the dopant atoms in silicon and silicon dioxide, there is a charge accumulation at the top surface. If you say some values, put some values like 20 like thing, some orbit value I am putting, so it will show the charge accumulation on the top surface. So, but in, in this case it is not uh, important, since we are growing uh, some kind of uh, not growing some silicon dioxide on the top surface. Now, the reflectance, reflectance from the top surface, here you can put either fixed values or some coating you can specify. Okay. So, fixed values means you can put a fixed reflectance around all wavelength on the spectrum. See spectrum, uh, spectrum for silicon solar cell is from 300 to around 1100 nanometer, but for every wavelength the reflectance is different, right. But here if you put say 12, uh, 10 percent or 12 percent, then it will take 10 percent reflectance for every wavelength from the surface. So, this is one thing and the other thing is that the coated thing. So, here you are assuming that uh, it has a basic reflectance and on all wavelength. Uh, which is around say 10 percent again. Now, apart from that reflectance, you are putting some layer, some uh, silicon nitride layer or anti reflection coating layer to minimize the reflection at a particular uh, wavelength. Like uh, in case of uh, irradiation spectrum, the most important part is around 550 nanometer. Okay. So, we would like to minimize the 550 nanometer wavelength, the reflection of the 550 nanometer wavelength. So, there is a formula called, uh, uh, I mean there is a formula through which you can calculate what should be the thickness of the anti reflection coating for a particular wavelength. So, you can put the refractive index of the coating and you can put the thickness. So, by managing these two, you can uh, use the, the minimize the reflection of the uh, particular wavelength. Here is a help menu, if you are not understanding, you can use that. I think is it, yeah actually the OS is, uh, OS is either Vista or Windows 7 I think. In OS, Vista and Windows 7 the help menu does not work actually, in XP it works. There is some file missing for this uh, software, so that does not work actually. No, it does not. The help is not watching. Sorry? It is XP there, but still, but still you are not getting the help menu. Okay. Yeah. So, for every point there is a help option available. So, you can go through it. If you are not understanding my words, you can get references from there. So, the reflectance part is basically again for these uh, two things, either fixed and coated. So, you can go for the fixed reflectance cell in 10 percent. 
or you can go for a coated sample, I mean with some silicon nitride coating. Uh, the refractive index for silicon nitride is around uh, 2.0 or 2.1 like that. So, we can put let us say 2.1 and the thickness of the layer is around 17 nanometer. So, and the broadband reflectance we can put again 10 percent. So, both the way you can do it, I mean, okay. is it fine? See, when we grow the SiO2, it is grown from the top surface, right. Now, the top surface is diffused, SiO2 grow, growth is done after the diffusion process. So, whatever dopant material is down there on the top surface, while the growth process, it will also be incorporated inside the SiO2. Now, the solubility of that dopant atom in SiO2 and silicon will might be different. Due to that difference, there might be some charge accumulation at the source surface interface, silicon and silicon dioxide interface. So, that thing can be taken account here. No, that is not for solar cell actually, because uh, in case of solar cell, we generally deposit silicon nitride. So, that growth mechanism is not very important. Okay. Then, uh, the next thing is uh, exterior ref rear reflectance. This thing you can again put the same thing, but uh, rear reflectance is not generally counted, because it is mainly in case of concentrated solar cell, where the radiation also comes from the back side. So, I, uh, this is not important for plain solar cell. This internal uh, reflectance, okay. so it is due in at the interface. So, see if you go for the solar cell, you have the cell and on top of it, you have a, an anti reflection coating. So, whatever radiation falls on it on the anti reflection coating first, it will get reflected. The less part will be uh, transmitted into the cell. Then, at the nitride, silicon nitride and silicon interface, there will be another reflection. Those reflections are taken account in this uh, thing, uh, this internal reflectance and other things. So, you can put some values here, say 90 percent. And frankly speaking, I have not understood this thing actually. So, I am just putting some standard value they have used for PV cell. So, here they are saying it is reflectance, but they are putting 90 percent, 70 percent like that. So, I think uh, we will put some stand value which they have used in case of solar cell. Okay. Then the next is emitter contacts. So, here you can put the resistance provided by the emitter contact and the base contact. The position of the contact again can be specified at this point. So, as I said the uh, dimension starts from the front side. So, the emitter contact will be at 0 micrometer and the base contact will be at the position where the at the thickness value will be the same as the, the thickness. So, still now we have not specified the thickness, but we are putting let us put it like uh, 10,000 micrometer. So, that will not be a problem, I will explain after put fixing the thickness thing. And the resistance value we can uh, put uh, uh, accordingly. So, let us put a point zero zero one and point zero zero four. Okay. The collector collector circuit is not important because we are only dealing with the diode structure. So, in case of transistor simulation, you might be using this collector. Other thing. So, that is one thing, and uh, so emitter and base contacts are enabled here. And internal shunt elements here in solar cell, you will find lot of uh, points uh, which is called shunt points, shunt path or shunt points. So, where the yes, previous setting, okay. So, it is kind point 0.1 milli ohm and point 0.4 milli ohm. Okay. So, the shunt things, there are two majorly two types of shunt in solar cell, one is conductor kind of shunt that is kind of ohmic shunts and the other one is diode shunts. So, you can there are four shunts, I mean four things you can specify separately, 
suppose you enable the shunt thing and put a uh, see in case of conductor you have to put the uh, Siemens value that conductance value. So, let us say a shunt is around uh, 200 ohms or 2000, 200 ohms let us say. So, 1 by 200 is like 0 0.05 I think I guess 0 0.05. Okay. So, it enables one shunt path for the cell, okay. it will be it will appear here and if you go for the other kind of shunts, you can again enable the multiple kind of shunts uh, for the cell. So, so, that you have to look uh, what kind of shunts uh, is there in the cell you want to model. Okay. Yeah. Shunt is kind of see. Okay. So let us say this is n n plus p cell solar cell, and on top of it you are putting the front contact, and do the annealing thing for making good ohmic contacts to the cell. But due to some reason, suppose this. Uh, n plus p is done by diffusion. Okay. Now, during the diffusion you have some impurity on top of it on top of the surface and you did not get such an uniform junction. Okay. So, your junction is like this. So, it is not very uniform over the surface and now you are putting your metal contacts here and doing the annealing thing. So, the metal contacts is penetrating the junction and is again connecting the uh, p type layer. So, these contacts are for uh, n type contacts and for back contacts you have another contacts for p, p type. Okay. Now, you have both the contacts uh, for p type the front one as well as back one. So, it is creating shunt, shunt paths for the cell. So, it will reduce the uh, effectiveness of the cell. I've, I mean there are lot of other things. So, you can put the shunt values in uh, this uh, ok. So, ok. Now, the cell thickness generally it is uh, around 275 or 300 micrometer. So, put it 300 micrometer ok. Now, again I am going back to this contact thing. So, you see here we have specified 10,000 the actual cell thickness is 300 micrometer only. So, you can put it 300 here, okay. but if you put values higher than that, it will automatically take that uh, cell thickness value as the position of the base contact. Okay. Now, the material, what material we are going to use. So, if you double click it, it will open the set of files uh, for the material. So, you can select this uh, silicon dot si dot mat material as the material for the solar cell. Okay. So, if you select this uh, silicon material, it will automatically check all these models like uh, carrier mobilities, dielectric constant, band gap, intrinsic concentration, refractive index, absorption, free carrier and p type. No, up to this free carrier absorption. So, it will take the default values from silicon for the silicon thing. Okay. If just double click on it, it will open the material files, you select the silicon one. You can use also the other things like uh, indium phosphide indium and germanium galenium oxide other things. Okay. Is it fine? So, if you select this silicon dot mat, then it will select all these values. The next thing is the, the diffusion thing, how do you diffuse. So, let us take p type background of it, uh, doping concentration as 1.1 1 .1 into 10 to the power 16 and let us take it uh, p type sorry. Uh, so, we are working on this uh, n plus p type of cell. So, let us uh, put this uh, thing is uh, 1.e to the power 16, it is set already I think. Okay. So, this is the background substrate dop, uh, doping uh, thing. Now, it diffuse the front uh, emitter from the front side. Okay. So, click on this front diffusion, there are lot of options available. 
So, first enable it, now the dopant material will be entry, right. So, now there are different option what kind of uh, profile you want to get. So, basically uniform profile is basically for the ion implantation thing, uh, exponential I do not know <laughs> frankly. Uh, Gaussian is for two step diffusion and error function is for uh, single step diffusion, okay. So, you can select this uh, any of these thing and here is you have the peak doping which occurs at the top surface, okay. And the depth factor is basically not very understood, but we assume that it is uh, the uh, diffusion length of the dopant atoms. So, if you select these two automatically you will find the uh, sheet resistance and junction depth accordingly. Suppose it is 1.1 e to the power 20 and let us assume it is it to be 0 0.1. So, it will automatically automatically take the sheet resistance value and the junction depth to be 128 uh, ohms per square and 275 micrometer respectively. If you go for Gaussian it will change accordingly. So, the junction will be around 300 uh, nanometer and the sheet resistance will be like 86. So, basically this is a depth thing, this is say depth and this is your impurity concentration. So, basically the impurity profile for n type is something like this, okay. So, let us say it is 10 to the power 20. Okay, and this is 10 to the power 16. So, the n type profile, this is for n type phosphorus profile, let us say. This profile will be like this for after diffusion thing, and your background dopant concentration is constant. Okay. So, it is like 10 to the power 16. Okay. So, this one is the background doping concentration, and this one is the concentration of the n type thing, this is p type. Okay. So, where the though, uh, concentration of n type and p type are meeting to same values that is the junction. So, this is the junction depth and this is the peak uh, concentration at the surface. So, let, uh, let me draw the whole solar cell structure and what are the parameters that you need to fill in this. Uh. Okay, so, the starting uh, material always is some wafer which can be p type or n type. Okay. Uh, so, when you start a, a wafer, let us say it is a p type, then you need to give some uh, material parameter. So, if it is silicon, then what is its doping level? And that is the one parameter that you require for the substrate. So, you have to choose whether it is p type or n type that you can do in the simulator, and then you have to choose what is the doping level. Okay. So, what is the, if it is a p type, then what is the acceptor carrier concentration or what is the doping basically? So, this is one pair, this is two choices you have to make while selecting the substrate, right. Now, after you make the substrate, uh, after you choose the substrate and typically this doping level as we discuss is about 10 for 16, 10 for 15, 10 for 16, it should not be 10 for 12 or 13 or it should not be 10 for 18, 19, it is too high, 10 for 12 and 13 is too low doping level. So, 15 and 16 is optimized value. But of course, when you are doing simulation, you can try anything and you will find the, uh, the effect of uh, what happens if you choose different doping. Okay. The next step in the in the industrial process is actually do the texturing. Okay, texturing. So, now when you do the texturing, it can the, the whole the wafer then uh, this wafer will become actually like this. Okay, now the I think the software gives the choice to have the textured surface both front and back. Okay. So, you can choose texturing and then there is a parameter to define how much is the texturing. Texturing is done to reduce the reflection process, right. As the solar cell should be doing three functions, absorb as much as possible and separate carriers and collect carriers. Okay. So, to inc increase absorption, you need to reduce the reflection, which can be reduced by the reflect uh, by the texturing. So, the software will give choice to uh, select the parameter. What, what it gives in terms of what? The thickness, uh, height of the height of the parameters. Yeah, height of the and the angle. And angle. 
Okay. So, this if you actually zoom into this part of the texturing, it is normally a, a kind of pyramidical structure okay. and that is what actually happens in silicon also. When you do the chemical texturing uh, and if you start uh, the appropriate orientation of the substrate, you will actually get the pyramids and you can choose what is the height of the pyramids, what is the angle of the pyramids. So, that will define your textured surface. So, that is another choice you need to another parameter that you need to make. Okay. Now, once you have done the texturing, the next step is actually to uh, make the junction. Okay. So, suppose this is your, so what are the choices you already made by this point? You already made what is your base which is p type or n type, you already decided what is its doping level, you decided whether the front surface is textured or not. If it is textured, you decided already what is the height of pyramid, what is the angle of pyramid. You already decided what is the bake surface textured or not. If it is textured, what is the height of pyramid and what is the angle of it. So, that much this in you have made already. So, that information you have given to the software. The next step is to uh, make the junction. Okay. So, if you are studying substrate is p type, of course, your junction doping has to be of opposite type, n type, right. So, then uh, and the pyramid heights are normally in the range of 4 to 5 micron, okay, but your junction depth is very small as I, as I told you yesterday, the junction depths are typically 300, 400 nanometer, 500 nanometer. Okay. What does it mean? Your junction will exactly follow your top surface like this because these pyramids are very, very large as compared to the depth of the junction, right. And this junction, this region is going to be of n type. Okay, this is going to be of n type. <coughs> One thing, second thing, the doping of the n type that emitter is much higher than the base doping, right. Typically, the doping of emitter base is 10 to 16 the doping of emitter is 10 for 19 or so. Second thing it is made out of the diffusion. So, the base doping is normally, so if I look at the base doping it is constant over the depth of the thickness. If I look at the emitter doping it is not constant, it is a certain profile, right. Now, this profile can be of different type, it can be like if you are do, depends on how you are making the junction. So, are you doing implantation, are you doing diffusion? If you are doing diffusion, it is a one step or two step and things like. So, the profile can be separate and the software gives you possibility to choose one. So, error function complementary is a one function which is normally used or Gaussian one of the two. So, this profile you, you have to choose Gaussian profile or error function complementary profile and you have to uh, it also gives opportunity to give to choose the surface concentration. So, you need to choose this concentration level and you need to choose what depth junction is formed, right. So, if this is your profile and this is your background doping, so and this is your surface and this is the depth. So, at this point this is your junction depth, right. The point at which the p type impurity, p type doping becomes the base doping, n type doping becomes equal to the base doping that is your junction. When the both impurities levels are both the doping levels are equal. Okay, now, so, now the software gives you opportunity to choose a depth of the junction and the surface concentration. This concentration typically you should choose in the range of 10 to 19 and the depth now of course, we have earlier solar cell uh, we used to have a, in 1960s and all. So, solar cell used to have a junction of 2 micron or so, but now it has come down to 300 nanometer, 400, 500 nanometer and there are reasons, there are technical reasons for that and we did not have enough time to discuss. In December, we discuss everything why 300 nanometer, why so, why surface doping of 10 to 19, why the emitter doping is higher than the base doping, all those things there are reasons behind that and we will discuss why, but it is not enough time. So, but it gives, allow, it does allow you to choose the appropriate uh, uh, junction depth which can be up to 300 to 500 nanometer with appropriate profile of the, this one can be error function, can be Gaussian, nobody does the implantation right, uh, for the junction making. So, it is normally diffusion. So, that is another choice you have to make. Uh, 
So, once you decide this, now your emitter is there, okay, your base is there. What is the next? What if we should do the next? What else is required to make the solar cell complete? Putting the context, right, front and the back context. But one more step we need to do before that is to put the, uh, as I said, there are two ways to reduce the reflection. One is doing the physical modification of the surface, that is texturing, and other is uh, putting the anti reflective coating. Okay. So, again you need to put anti reflective coating and you need to uh, you need to define what what is that anti reflective coating. It is basically one dielectric material having certain refractive index and thickness and the material. So, you need to so what what happens you you need to put I am putting a black line here. So, this what, what you have to put is A R C anti reflective coating. Typically, anti reflective coating uh, uh, because light is coming through the anti reflective coating, it should not absorb anything. So, it, it should be thin, right, because you want light to go into the your solar cell, it should, it light should not get, get absorbed into anti reflective coating. So, typically, it should be thin. So, you need to give following parameters one is you need to give thickness, you need to give what material it is, and also refractive index and refractive index of the, the layer or you can define the reflectance itself. Yeah, the material you defined. Okay, so, uh, once you define material, you are already defining R i, the refractive index. Okay, so, so, typical thickness, for example, typical material that is used for solar cell is silicon nitride. So, S i 3 n 4 is the R 1 minus x, S i x n 1 minus x. So, this is a typical material, but you can also use silicon oxide, silicon nitrate, silicon oxide. There can be several other possibilities of choosing a material. So, once you decide material, you already decided the refractive index, then you have to decide the thickness of the material. Okay. In industry, uh, this thickness is in the range of about 70 nanometers. Okay, so, your solar cell technology is actually a nano technology, right. According to the definition, anything below 100 nanometers is a nano. So, solar cell, commercial solar cell do make use of nano technology. 70 nanometer, then you can actually define the reflectance, overall reflectance as, as well. How much should be the reflectance? 90 percent? 80 percent? How much? It should be very low, not 80, 90 percent. If 80, 90 percent, nothing will work, right. Ideally, it should be 0 and practically 0 is not possible. So, it will be like uh, in the base cases people have demonstrated up to 3, 4 percent overall reflectance across the all wavelengths. Okay. The, that you can define. Right? So, it can be 3, 4, 5, 10 percent depending on the what else you can define in terms of ARC. So, yeah that so, R i you can reflect to index you can choose. So, if you look at the reflectance profile, if you if you choose single layer uh, anti reflective coating, the reflectance profile looks like this. So, the minimum, so this is the reflectance and this is the wavelength. So, minimum reflectance will occur at one wavelength, right, but you want to minimize the reflectance at several wavelengths. So, then people actually can come up with the double layer anti reflective coating, where there will be two ref minima uh, reflectance or you can choose three of them, but as you are I mean as you are putting the more number of layers in practice it becomes more and more difficult to make such device and also the thickness will increase absorption in the anti reflective coating will increase which is not desirable. So, industrial solar cell only make use of single layer anti reflective coating that is RC, but in when you are doing your laboratory solar cells and you want to maximize your efficiency you can go for double layer also. So, that is another choice that you have to make and then uh, uh, BSF is there any? Yeah, BSF yes. we can provide, back side you can diffuse again. Okay, so, now, uh, so your starting substrate was P, your do emitter is because heavily doped, when doping is higher then we add plus sign, okay. so it is called N plus. 
if there is even higher doping we call it n plus plus okay so, so depending on that now uh, what people actually do is which actually occurs automatically in industrial process is uh, to to reduce the recombination of the back surface they create some kind of field at the back side okay and they call it back surface field how does it work so back, so how do we make back surface field let me put it here so they make a p plus okay heavy doping of the the boron atom so how does it work so you have again okay and this region is a p plus region so what is your solar cell structure not pn anymore it's a p plus p n plus that is your solar cell what is the role of p plus let us let us draw the energy band diagram so if you if you make the fermi level and this is your p and if it is p plus fermi level will be closer to the valence band so this is your p plus so you have such kind of what do you see here what as soon as you notice this line what do you see electric field you know, lines are not flat anymore because there is a difference in the doping so this is your p plus part and this is your p plus part as soon as you see that lines are not straight or flat which means there is electric field if there is electric field what does it mean if there is electron here it will not go there right there is a problem because it has to go to higher energy so it is actually repelling electrons towards this side which is the junction side so thus creation of p plus p will create some kind of field which is here and this field will repel electrons towards the junction and we want all the generated carriers to go to the junction so that they can be separated and contribute to the current so that's why this back side field is important very important for the operation and it is referred as a b back surface field okay so you can again define the back surface field what are the parameters you think will be there for the back surface field doping of course p plus doping so if base is p p plus will be higher so your base is tens for 16 your bsf will have higher doping right tens for 18 19 kind of and again the thickness of the bsf layer typically 4 5 micron 10 micron that you can have so you you the parameter that you need to do is doping and the thickness okay doping in this case would be about other tens power 18 19 per centimeter cube and thickness can go from few microns to uh, tens of 10 micron let's say 2 to 10 micron okay what else yeah so once uh, so once you decide once you uh, so bulk means basically the base material which is the bulk of the material another parameter for the base material is one parameter is doping that is the starting uh, wafer but other important parameter is the lifetime okay lifetime is the lifetime of the carriers you know how long carriers remain in excited state before they recombine okay higher the lifetime better it is so lifetime can vary from very bad material which will have lifetime of nanoseconds to a good material very good material which will have a lifetime of milliseconds okay so several orders of magnitude it can vary which is very very important the very high quality material like flotsam silicon will have very high lifetime milliseconds kind but it is very expensive nobody use those kind of material for making commercial solar cells okay very low lifetime like nanosecond which is the case for uh, very degraded material like amorphous silicon which is extremely bad and uh, uh, crystalline silicon lifetime is better than that so crystalline silicon solar cell monocrystalline particularly will have lifetime in the range of microseconds okay typically it will go from let's say one few microsecond to 20 30 100 microseconds so that is the typical range of the lifetime so uh, that you have to define for your base material so what i'm saying is for crystalline silicon this can go from few microsecond to let's say 1 microsecond to hundreds of microsecond so that is the the range that you have to define by defining the lifetime what are you doing you are defining the quality of the material right by defining the lifetime you are defining the quality of the material so higher quality material will have higher lifetime which means carriers will remain higher uh, spend higher time in the excitation mode okay then we before uh, before coming to the contacts there are there are 
now you so at end you have to make a context okay and of course, front contact probably you have to define the finger width and everything else, but you can't define. And the back contact in the crystalline silicon solar cell is continuous. Okay, so back contact is continuous. Front contact is not continuous. Why? Because you need light to get in, right? So you cannot make a continuous contact. If you put metal everywhere, nothing will go in. So you need to give a space for the light to go in. Now, once carriers are there, uh, they can actually recombine at three places, they can recombine in the bulk of material, they can recombine in the surface which is the front side and they can recombine at the back side. And the recombination is something we all want, right? Oh, we do not want, oh sorry. So, recombination is something we do not want, right? We do not want anywhere the recombination. So, uh, we need to tell this, uh, the simulator that what is, how much is the recombination taking place? So, how much is the recombination taking place? The recombination in the bulk has already been defined by the lifetime, right? What I am saying, lifetime is 10 microsecond, which means carrier will not recombine up to 10 microsecond, after that they will recombine. So, you have already defined it, but the recombination at the surfaces, surface itself is a two dimensional uh, uh, structure, right? The bulk of the material is a three dimensional, surface is a two dimensional. So, at the surface recombination is defined by not lifetime, but it is defined by what is called surface recombination velocity. Okay. Surface recombination velocity. Okay. It is a rate of recombination per unit area at the surface. So, the unit of surface recombination velocity will be what? What will the unit of surface recombination velocity? It is a velocity, right? So, it is a centimeter per second. Okay. Higher the velocity, higher the velocity, better it is or worse it is? Worse it is, right? High recombination velocity means lot of recombination taking place. So, we do not want high recombination velocity ideally, but naturally that is uh, that does not happen. So, high value of surface recombination velocity which is really, really bad is stands for 6 centimeter per second, extremely high recombination. Okay. A moderate value of surface recombination velocity stands for 3 or of that order and a very good value of surface recombination velocity is 10. Okay. 10 is very good, this is moderate and this is very bad. Okay. So, by doing the uh, deciding the surface recombination velocity, we are defining how much is the recombination taking place at the surface. Is the recombination at the surface is in our control? Is the recombination at the surface is in our control? Yes, we can control it by appropriate treatment of the surface. Okay. So, for example, your anti reflective coating silicon nitride is not only an anti reflective coating, but is also a passivation layer or control layer which reduces the recombination, but not be extremely effective. There are other ways of doing. So, your uh, normal silicon nitride layer will give recombination at the moderate level SRV at times for 3 uh, that kind of level, but you can do much better than that. But remember in practice, there is always cost associated of doing things better. You know, you can start with extremely high lifetime material, but it is expensive. You, know, you can do the very nice texturing, it is expensive. You can do very nice anti reflective coating, but it is expensive. You can do very nice surface specification, but expensive. So, there is always you need to look at the compromise between the material parameter or the technology that you choose and eventually what you get. But of course, this is simulation, try your best. So, you can get uh, some 20, 30 percent efficiency from this tool or 30 percent you will not reach, but you can try. But the, the important thing of this simulation is that you can know the effect of parameters immediately. If you do the 100 microsecond lifetime and do the simulation and do the 1 microsecond lifetime, you will immediately know what is the effect. And therefore, it is a very simple tool, it is a PC 1D, it is a one dimensional tool, very fast, any computer can run this tool. It is free, anybody, any student can do it and does not take much time. Once you are used to it, it will hardly take uh, half an hour to sit and make any device of your choice.
very very nice tool. Okay, so coming back to the surface recombination velocity, you need to define how much recombination is taking place, and that can be done by the surface recombination velocity. Many of this term actually uh, you may not be aware, but because we have not discussed solar cell in detail, but in your December workshop everything will go step by step. So by the time we will come to this level, you will you know exactly what is the meaning of SRV and things like that. Okay, so don't worry if you don't. Uh, it doesn't make sense to you right now. Uh, then finally, the metal contact. No contact, we cannot define it. Contact is defined only in terms of the resistance. So it is one-dimensional simulation. So there is no kind of finger spacing and other. Thing. Only thing it is saying that we have some contact, base contact, and emitter contact. It basically deals with the only the semiconductor portion. So contact in PC one we can define only in terms of resistance. Okay, or resistivity. Resistance internal. Okay. Yeah. okay, so you just define the resistance of the contact at the front and back. I think it is one only one contact. So it will just take some resistance value and it will do the simulation, right? So these are the all parameters that you can feed into the simulator. Is that clear, everybody? Now, what are the parameters you need to feed and why you need to feed, right? Now some of these parameters are default parameters. So like when you say, okay, I want to choose P silicon, then it will take lot of parameters related to the P silicon and doping. So, this is what you need to give to the simulator, but the next question is what you will get out of it, right? What you will get out of it? The two important thing that you will get out of it is efficiency, right? Okay. So, you need to you will get efficiency, you will get basically IV curve. So, you need you will get IV curve, you will get curve something like this. Right, it will give you short circuit current, it will give you open circuit voltage, it will give you fill factor, it will give you efficiency, it will give you series resistance, right? You, oh, you that we have given it. Okay, so but these are the main parameters that it will actually give it to you. It will draw the IV curve for you also. It will draw the IV curve for you also. So suppose now there are lot of lot of study that you can do. Uh, and people have done earlier and even now they people do it. So, even now you will see lot of not lot, but some research paper which is comes based on the PC 1 D simulation, international research in the journal. So, one analysis I mean of course, this is a very basic analysis what you can do is okay, let us say you are starting with the doping of 10 to 16, but you are doing various lifetime of the base. Okay. So, you can start with the lifetime which may be 1 microsecond, 10 microsecond. 20 microsecond, 100 microsecond, do the simulation for all this. And what you will see is, you will find different, different curves. So you can put them curve together, you will find the trend. What is the trend of the open circuit voltage as a function of the lifetime? Or what is the trend of a short circuit current as a function of a lifetime? Or what is the trend of a efficiency as a function of a lifetime? So, this is one example. Okay. Then you can, okay, then you can also vary SRV, surface recombination velocities and lot, lot of graphs. You can do it, you need to just spend some time and you will guide. So, this will actually really be useful in understanding what happens if this is the case, right. So, the uh, IV curve is one important outcome of it, but the another important outcome of uh, this uh, tool is uh, is called quantum efficiency. Okay. Quantum efficiency is efficiency of quanta. Normally, whenever when I try to explain the, the the simplest explanation is put the words in a proper perspective. Okay, so quantum efficiency, the efficiency of a quanta. What is the quantum of energy? One photon is one quantum of energy, right? So what each photon is doing in a solar cell is a quantum efficiency, right? For every photon going in, how many electrons I'm going getting out? Okay, at best you'll get one electron out. So then your quantum efficiency is hundred percent. For each photon, there is one electron, 100 percent quantum efficiency, right. Now, because your photon energy is varying, your photon wavelength is varying, right, your photon uh, wavelength is varying. So, you have to define quantum efficiency for each quanta, which means each wavelength. Okay. So, whenever you, what does it mean? So, whenever, what it means that whenever you plot quantum efficiency graph, it is going to be as a function of wavelength, no doubt about that. 
because you are talking about quantum efficiency and the photon wavelength changes, photon energy changes. Therefore, efficiency you need to plot efficiency as a function of wavelength. Is that clear to everybody? Okay, so quantum efficiency graph is as a function of wavelength. So, in x axis you put wavelength and y axis what you will put? Efficiency, simple. Put efficiency, but quantum efficiency. What is the best case efficiency? 100 percent. For each photon, if you are getting one electron, 100 percent or 0 percent, if you are not getting anything. 0 percent is the case that you do not want, 100 percent is the case that is not possible. So, you will get efficiency in between, right. Okay, so, from where your graph should start? At what wavelength your graph should start? 300. Okay, so, your graph should start let us say 300 nanometer and it should go up to what level? Depending on the source is of course, solar spectrum goes up to 400, I am sorry 4000 nanometer, 4 micrometer, but when, when uh, depending on the band gap all the lower energy photons are not absorbed. So, your graph should go up to the band gap energy of the of the material. So, silicon is having 1 point 1.12 electron volt band gap, what is the corresponding wavelength? Calculate, calculate. So, this is the band gap energy of the silicon. What is the corresponding wavelength? How do we find out? E in electron volt is equal to 1.24 divided by lambda in micrometer. So, what we want here? We want lambda in micrometer. So, this should be 1.24 divided by E band gap which is 1.12. How much it is? 1.24 divided by 1.12? 1.1 micron or 1100 nanometer. Okay. So, your graph for silicon will go up to 1100 nanometer. Okay. Your graph for cadmium telluride solar cell will not go up to 1100 nanometer because that band gap is higher. So, the cutoff will occur earlier. Your graph for amorphous silicon will not go up to 1100 nanometer because again amorphous silicon band gap is higher and it will cut off earlier, right? Fine. So your graph will have. So if I plot this is zero, this is let's say 50, and this is 100 percent. Your quantum efficiency graph typically looks like something like this. And again for various lifetime, if you plot this graph for various lifetime 1 microsecond, 10 microsecond, 20, 100, 200, you will see immediately the difference in the quantum efficiency graph. How do you see that? So, this is like a diagnostic tool. Quantum efficiency tells about what is happening at your surface, what is happening at your junction, what is happening at your bulk of the material and what is happening at the back side of the solar cell. Okay? So, uh, so, let me draw very quickly. So, I am just putting your solar cell is here. Okay, light enters from here. Your emitter is very small, your bulk is very thick. Okay. So, this part of the quantum efficiency curve tells about what is happening at the back side. This part of the quantum efficiency tells what is happening at the front side. This part of the quantum efficiency tells what is happening here. Right, so, that kind of diagnostic. So, your front surface is not well passivated or your surface accommodation velocity of, of the front surface is very high. What will happen to the quantum efficiency curve? It will not start from 50, it will start from lower value. If your back surface is not passivated, it will go all the way down very fast. If your lifetime is very small, then this curve will actually go like this. So, this can tell lot about the material itself. So, basically what you are saying each how each photon is performing. If you take a photon of 500 nanometer, how many of them are successfully getting converted into electron and therefore current, right. And therefore, the quantum efficiency curve is another important curve. Passivation means you pacify. If somebody is really shouting, you pacify. You know children in, in uh, foreign countries, they use pacifier. If the children is crying, they put something, it pacifies them, keep it quiet. So, surface is specified means what? If without without surface specification, surface is very dangerous. It is recombining all the electrons. It is hungry of electrons. So, you satisfy its hunger by 
uh, what exactly is done is you put some layer. So, uh, sir, at surface, so if you look at the crystal, you know the atoms are nicely arranged with each other and sharing the bonds and electrons. And go to the surface, there is sudden disruption, and because of disruption, some bonds are not made. Okay, so they they want electron, and they take electron from all this uh, generated electron. So they kill them. So pacify them. So you they want electron. Basically, they want some electron to share the bond. So you put some hydrogen or something. So silicon hydrogen bond will make, and then you you uh, provide the condition for the bonding, and that is what it does. Is that fine? Now let me stop here. Otherwise, uh, time for simulation will run out of it. But these are the two important things that you can get out of your simulator: IV curve and quantum efficiency curve, and all the parameters that you can define. What you can do now or later. So this seminar will be available. So maybe from six o'clock in the evening till twelve o'clock in the night today, you can do all kind of simulation with this computer. Okay? It is freeware. You can download. So maybe you can give the link which you can download. Link is already given. Okay, fine. So there are a lot of things are possible with the software, and as I told, there are still some paper which keeps on coming, which are in the International Journal, which are based on the PC1D simulation. So a lot of things, if your particular thing can actually define, and a lot of information can be extracted. Okay, so uh, I'll stop here. Any questions so far? How to define a parameter? What parameters are required, and how to do it? Uh, so will tell.